Okay, now I start the recording and um, if uh, from your side, Rennie, there's anything else to add, uh, kind of information um, of administrative nature or anything else? Not from, not at this moment. Um, the, the students are on board and the secretariat will be attending uh, as much as, as much as much as we can so just to appreciate your time uh, over to you prof Les. thank you very much so i will actually start with um i don't know if that was uh, uh, it was possible to circulate it it's of course all quite uh, under time pressure but i will circulate this information here first that is about this course so on friday i think also in namibia you have a holiday isn't it so that means yes. also here here is a holiday um and that means we have four days in this week only and the topics are the following of course it's module two you had a first module already on the introduction to iwm and now we are going to visit the the water resources systems so that is module two and um today i'm talking about yeah what is the system approach all ab about and some basic definitions that means understanding especially the fluxes within the system uh, for that we need to understand the basics of hydrology or of, of water resources um, then tomorrow we will talk about the water resource system assessment. No? So that is uh, typically if you are thinking about management, you first need to have the assessment correctly done. That means the current state of our system, of our water resources systems. So what is the, the current dynamics of the system in terms of water availability, of water fluxes, of water demand? Uh, where do we have a lack of demand or a lack of other system characteristics that are desirable, uh, we, then you can derive from that the challenges and the problems of the system. Once you have identified them, then you can start thinking about how can we optimize the system? How can we uh, yeah, reach a state that, that is desired? No? That means reaching the goals. And this step you can also call it the design of the system or the design of interventions and measures. That is perhaps the most important one in this context. It's it's basically referring to the, the overall term again, the integrated water resource management. But here we are still following the system approach. This is why we call this water resources system management. And the fourth day is really about the important uh, idea of how data plays a role in that uh, what is the the information flow that is necessary in order to allow for water resources system management and also what how can we analyze the data or add additional information to to the system that means we are modeling the system so that is basically the idea of the third day the central role of information and all that. Yeah, four short days and uh, we are typically here that the time is from nine to 12. So um, I'm giving an introduction from nine to 10. So that is uh, perhaps today until 1015 because uh, we started a bit late. Uh, and then we have a short break and um, Samar, Myrna and Bilal, who will join us a bit later, he, they will take over and, and go through, uh, let's say, an application, but also having a chance for more feedback, of course. No? But it's, it's mainly yeah, familiar, familiarizing yourself with the, the content a little bit more. Okay, so now I will go to the PowerPoint of the first session, that is the system approach and basic definitions. So let me go to that, sharing it for you, recording it as you wish. So you can later, I can later share the link um, of, of this recording. So you can now see the first slide, I hope. 
Is it also full screen for you? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So module two, that means we are here talking about the whole program. You will have module three. Um, I, I think it's more about sanitation or if I'm not mistaken, and then also about uh, financial issues. I think there's one module and, and about climate change. So each of the modules has a certain focus. The focus here is the system approach, you know, water resources systems. Unit one, that is the, the one of today, it's about a system approach and basic definitions. Let me run through the slides. And because if I, uh, usually I say, okay, whenever you have a question, you can interrupt me, that is still true. So if you really have a, a, some doubts, you can raise your hand and I will notice that. Uh, on the other hand, I'm today not giving, a, let's say a lot of room for, for interaction. Uh, usually, I, I also have some slides where I say, oh, sure, okay, you should think, you should apply. We, we have a kind of short exercise, but I will skip that today because otherwise uh, I will really need more than one hour even for that. So let me go through the slides to share the idea of this session. And at the end, of course, questions and answers uh, are there and, and then a short break and, and then you have even more time also applying it you know, to, to certain model systems, so to say. Okay, so let us start with an example. You know? So it's always good to have a concrete thing in mind. Why, why do we follow a system approach? You know? And what, of course, I will tell you what a system is. You, of, of course, all of you have an idea what a system is, but a typical example, no, that is uh, usually we say in a, in a nutshell, what are the problems of water management? It's too much water, it's too little water, or it's too dirty water. No? So that is almost covering uh, all, the, all the problems of water resource management. Now the too much and too little can apply for urban areas or citizens. It can apply for any kind of economic activity or agriculture. It can apply for nature, no? even nature natural ecosystems sometimes have a lack of water and they cannot thrive so that is it's all it's all something that is um, that is possible and could be a, a problem but uh, going to this one example here it's too much water so we often have inundations these inundations can happen uh, in in any place but if they happen in cities they always cause a lot of problems sometimes even casualties but usually infrastructure damages, you know, um, we, we summarize it in disaster risk management as loss and damage. And we don't want to have that. And, and now we uh, perhaps observe in a city more frequent and more intense inundations. And then the, the obvious question is, why is that happening? You know? So I could not now ask you, um, again, this would be the first interactive um, moment but um le let me just um go through it a bit faster so i could ask you and you would all give me the possible answers i think no of course it could be changing precipitation that is always the first thing you think about um, of course floods are ultimately caused by precipitation and if the patterns are changing that means in seasons where we don't have strong precipitation now have strong precipitation or in general the high intense rainfalls are getting more than also the the more frequent and intense inundation happen um, in our our part of the world uh, the it's very important when is the timing of snow melt if that is combined that could be uh, let's say another effect and and of course with global warming snow melt is shifting also in the year you no know? it's happening in another part another time of the year you no know? but it could also be related to changing land use you no know? because as we know the type of land use is if it's more sealed surface or if it is more of a kind of sponge uh, uh, land cover has a big in impact on runoff so looking at the changing land use in the upstream could be a cause for that but there could also be less retention areas retention areas are natural depressions for example or it could be the soil as such as a as a retention medium that is not there anymore to do this job uh, or it could come not from the upper catchment but in the in the city itself some floods are not caused by 
upstream but, uh, changes, but within the city itself. And that could be then the, the change of the city landscape could be a, a cause for it. No? So we don't know perhaps what is the real cause. And at the end, we can perhaps even think that the flooding in the city is an interaction of all these factors that I mentioned. You know? Of course, now, if you are in, in your part of the world, the snow would be excluded, I guess. You know? But other than that, it could be a combination of all. And now this is an example why a system approach is good, because here we would look at the whole system. That means in this case, we would look at the river going through a city and, and the river coming from a catchment from the upstream. And anything that is happening, anything that is changing in that whole system in the city plus the, the, the let's say, surrounding watershed and the upstream watershed, all that is considered here. And we make sure that we are including all the elements that are relevant. And that offers us a chance for an integrated solution. So in order to make IWM, integrated water resource management, a reality, we need to look at different sectors within in the, the overall system. We look at different spaces. No, this is this, the important space integration over space no but we also and that is of course also typical for a system a system is evolving over time no we also look at different times this system exists and and with that we have an integration over time and and that is also very important no so these are and and perhaps in the same system you may have now the the elements that are describing the physical flow of water but you also have institutions that are governing how we are behaving in that system that means how humans are interacting that could be an immediate behavior in the case of a flood or that could be the way we operate a reservoir according to a rule or it could be the long-term decisions that we make in changing the land use all that is of course i would say the most important part of the management because uh, management means that we as humans are actively interacting into the system for our own benefit that means we want to have the the the, the direct benefit from using water resources but also of course um, for the benefit of the environment itself that we want to have intact and provide the services we need in the future okay now let's look at systems in a in a more uh, general way so that is coming from the idea, and, and this is this small example has shown that that the the real world is complex. It's endlessly complex because if you think about all the interactions that happen, we can never model everything. You no, know, we know, for example, that climate is a complex system, and we are struggling a lot even to have a, a general let's say representation of the climate. You no, know? that means sometimes um, a system approach cannot be translated to having an, uh, let's say, a, a mathematical or physical model of the world, but sometimes at least a kind of conceptual model. You know? And that comes from the recognition that the world is complex and that there are many interactions that are relevant or that could be relevant in creating the current state and consequently also that we need to change to to reach the future state that means managing it governing it and that means we have to look at different elements and their interaction so that is that would be the the task to understand a system and to understand it in order to to steer it and this is actually the 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 offer that we have with the the promise of system thinking and that we are yeah, better in, in a role to understand the real world than the other option that would be a reductionist approach. No? And so typically we coming from different disciplines, coming from academia in particular, we are trained after the scientific revolution starting in the 17th century more and more science began to specialize you know? and uh, in the beginning you had more a universal approach to understand 
nature, so that are the natural sciences, and later also that is that started in the 19th century, really, when we also in, uh, included social systems or society and, and humans itself as a study uh, element. Uh, so even in the social sciences also, we were became more and more specialized. No? In natural science, we, we divided it into physics, chemistry, biology, geology, or earth sciences, and then later all the applied sciences related to that in the different fields of engineering. And you can go to specializations from biology, you go to to um, to cell biology, and then you go to a, a certain aspect of, uh, of, of biochemistry perhaps, or, or chemical reactions within a cell, et cetera. And you are becoming an expert on just the, the, the formation of a certain enzyme in a cell and how you could optimize that that production in a bacteria, for example. So becoming more and more specialized has been the trend until very recently. And that means this is a reductionist approach. We reduce the complexity of the real world and specializing on something very, uh, very specific. And that has a value, of course, but it is not helping us to understand the 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 real world in its complexity and not helping us to understand the problems that are related for example with uh, water resources management you could take other systems like energy system or the health system uh, these are uh, complex uh, systems that we try to manage but we can only manage it if we have at least a, an attempt to understand these complex real world systems so we have to dis distinguish that as i said reducing complexity could be also very helpful i'm not this is not a speech against reductionist um, approaches to science so if you study biochemistry and you really want to focus on one reaction mechanism uh, or the the formation of one certain molecule that could have curing effect as a as a medicine that is the way to go but in our part of the sciences that means in water resources management if you if you call it science it's it's really a field of application uh, we have to follow another scientific paradigm and that is system thinking so i there is no other way to it and even of course uh, i also mention here examples where also this reductionist view may be helpful that means you are isolating again everything uh, or, or not everything you're isolating exactly what you want to focus upon and you are um, let's say um, not considering everything else for example you just want to understand how the precipitation in a certain area is linked to discharge and you try to model just that 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 specific relationship that is also fine and it's necessary but that is not not really iwm it's it cannot help us to to uh, to solve the complex um, problems we are facing okay so systems thinking is necessary for decision making and governance
Um, I think Lars is having some issues with his internet, so can we just uh, wait for a bit? Stopped. Yeah. Ah, you stopped it. Okay, that is good. Now you you continued it. No. Yeah. Yeah, it's working now. Yeah. Okay. So that is the the idea of systems, and um, actually, we are we know systems in any science. No, that means here, for example, in engineering. No. Um, that is it's a system let's say like an engine could be described as a system no you you also have system engineering that is the idea of how to steer and and how to model in a, in a quantitative way in a mathematical way systems and optimize them no but also agricultural systems are very well known natural systems social systems for example in natural sciences biology is of course uh, very familiar with describing like a cell as a system no a cell is a system with a clear boundary that is the membrane and inside you have the organelles and you have the interaction of substances flowing from one to another in the in the different biological processes and you have an exchange with the environment no? so the same for an ecosystem an ecosystem is also described by a system approach no? in social systems you have a family as a system an organization as a system even a city or nation can be described as a system and, and in the more complex 
let's say, summary of different types of systems that are interacting, technical systems, social systems, natural systems. We have, for example, energy logistics or health system, and of course, water systems. No? So that is, that's the whole point here. Now the word is coming from systema, that's the, the Greek letters here, no one nowadays or few people know Greek, um, but that's the old language of science and uh, systema is actually uh, in, in Greek a set of interacting or in, interdependent entities no? um, that could be related to a real reality. We are talking here about reality, water resources, a real system. It could also be a more theoretical system, but they are connected with one another, forming some kind of described integrated whole. And we are describing a system by its elements. So that means within the system, you have different subsystems. We also call them components or elements and processes. So the processes are defining what is happening between the elements. No, it could be uh, the exchange of matter, the exchange of energy, and the exchange of information. So, for example, uh, a rain cloud, a cloud is uh, releasing rain to the land surface. No, so the, you have the sub-element cloud and the sub-element land surface, or perhaps a spe specific part of it, perhaps a forest. So, matter in this case, water is exchanged by from the cloud to the uh, to the forest, no? So that, that would be the example of two elements interacting. And then you have, of course, the exchange of energy as well. And uh, that means um, you are, for example, with evaporation, always there's also a transformation of energy, no? Or condensation is releasing energy. So the um, evaporation is, is consuming energy, so to say, you know? so that, uh, that and, 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 and like that. And information is, of course, not only related to the human information, the data and information that we refer to, but uh, also in the, in the living world in general, information is exchanged. You no, know? it could be even in a, in a, in a non-natural form. You know? it's, it's information about the characteristics of the elements and the change of the state of, uh, of, of the elements. And of course, the, the elements uh, are, let's say the cell, what is happening in a cell is de determining the behavior of the whole organ. What is happening in the organ is uh, determining the, the behavior of the whole organism and so on. So at the end, we are looking at the, the interrelationship between the elements, but there's also, of course, a cause and effect relationship within the elements. And um, we have now this example of cells and organs and body, we have so-called nested system. That means systems are embedded in other systems. And so you can um, look at systems in more detail and, and zoom into a subsystem, then the subsystem itself becomes a system that I'm analyzing and you can go to the broader level. And that helps a lot also in water resources. And there's something special about systems and that is the phenomenon of emergence. That means if you just add the properties of each subsystem, you would not be able to explain the system. So the system is creating a state that is uh, basically unique to the system uh, by the, the in interrelation of its uh, individual parts. You know? And that is yeah, often phrased in the sentence, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. You know? That is also typical for systems. Here you have a very simple visualization of what is a nested system. The blue is nested in the green, the green is nested in the turquoise, and then you have interactions and of course, also the other example I gave with the cell and so on. Then also, we are often describing systems with models that are representations of the real world systems. We are thinking in loops. No, that means there are, um, let's say, uh, impacts from one part of the system to another coming back perhaps to the original course. No, so that means there are uh, interactions among many parts of the system ultimately 
uh, impacting the original course as well. No? So that means these are loops that are very important in steering systems. We have to understand them in order to make use of them. And the interactions can be very dynamic. There can be delays. That means the course is not directly uh, converted to the to the uh, impact in, in the next element, but there may be a delay. There may also be feedbacks. That means if I uh, element A has an impact on B, B may also impact A. And with that, the behavior of A is changing or the, the original course is changing. No, this is These feedback loops are very good, uh, very important in self-regulation and reaching a kind of equilibrium or in, in system um, theory, we also call it homeostasis. Uh, but it can also lead to oscillations, no? because the regulation, especially if it has a delay, you may have a kind of development in one direction, then there is a feedback loop to it. You are moving in another direction, and um, but it's, it's perhaps, uh, let's say, uh, responding a little bit later, and then you see this typical oscillation in some systems. No? Yeah, and then of course, well, for us most important because we talk about management is then how can we make use of understanding the system in order to guide the system or steer the system. Yeah, some examples. So that is the, the example of ecosystem. Now I just take an ecosystem uh, as an example where it is obvious that um, there is an energy flow you know, now coming, of course, originally all the energy that is in any ecosystem comes from the sun going to the producers and then through the different levels of consumers. So and then at the end, um, if if the organic material dies, it is releasing energy again to the environment, no heat. And of course, from any of the other organism levels as well. But our energy is also transformed. That's the whole thing about eating uh, is of course getting the energy from the other uh, organisms in the, in, the, uh, in the food chain, et, et cetera. No? But there's also material flow. It's not only about energy, it's also about nutrients, it's about material that is exchanged and you you can describe a similar um, yeah relationship between different elements in this case elements of the ecosystem yeah so water resources managements they are having of course natural and technical components but also social economic economic components so this is something that that we should uh, have in mind in general. So this is one way to, or this is one example of a water resource system. And you see here the natural cycle, the, the rainfall, the runoff, the, the flow in rivers, of course, storage in lakes, and then the connection to the ocean. Uh, we don't see here the groundwater flow, but you also see the technical flow of water in the systems of human relevance, reservoirs, storing at distribution, supply water to different uses, uh, collecting water and discharging it or to irrigation systems, et cetera, et cetera. So now you can imagine that you can describe that system in, in the way of flow of water. Of course, energy is, is also involved in, in a natural form or in a technical form. And you can talk about all kinds of information that are exchanged about the level of the reservoir, the amount of water the plant needs, the uh, supply security for a household or whatever you want. In a more abstract form, we can describe that system perhaps in this way. So you have a boundary, you have an input and output. So of course a cloud can enter my system or not. I would not see the whole world as a system that would be a little bit too big perhaps, but you can describe the boundaries and then have, have an input of water, for example, through rainfall or an uh, output of water through evaporation from my system or even condensation. And then the cloud is moving away, for example. And then inside the system, you have different elements. So this is not a complete description of all the elements in a water system, but it's giving you the idea that you have a natural 
system you have sources of course not only one source you have the natural flow you have all kinds of ecosystem along this natural pathway of the river and then you have the the technical systems two major components are mentioned here uh, storing water treating it supplying it collecting wastewater treating it and bringing it back to the environment that would be the urban subsystem and then here is an example of an irrigation system again storage different channels irrigation drainage channels also connected to the natural system in many ways that would be an irrigation system of course we also have rain fed agricultural systems that would be equally a component here of our uh, general system no? and then, then you can say the elements of my system which is here described as a basin we say basin and in, in your part of the world you may prefer to use the term catchment or it's more frequent to perhaps say catchment or watershed watershed is used a lot in the united states but it's uh, it's a the same basic idea that we are talking about a region where water falls on it to to end up in one single um, outlet that is the mouth or the perhaps a confluence of, of a river no? so this basin is now here the the model system that we are looking at in hydrology or water resources management it makes a lot of sense sometimes we are obliged to use other boundaries because our management unit may not be uh, equivalent to a watershed so then we have to perhaps look at a uh, province no, or a country boundary and and talk about the water balance talk about the elements of the system in in that uh, given system as such but in an ideal sense we would just differentiate the watershed and then um, the subsystems the major subsystems would be here the urban region or urban water management including also industrial or commercial water uses and the other big subsystem is the agricultural system uh, uh, or if you want also the rural water system uh, including irrigated and rain fed agriculture yeah okay so that let us go a little bit faster because as i said time is running um, so we are talking here about different types of models sorry for that i needed to shift so we are trying to represent the real world and and this is often yeah we are we are we are simplifying the real world and, and let's say in looking at those elements of the real world systems that are most relevant no and th that is the first decision we have to make so what are in our uh task of analysis or our task of uh, of management are the most important elements and components of it so that would be always the first step to do and then we are describing how these most relevant elements of our system are interacting and if we describe that well then we have a model of the reality now that is the the term model of course you you all have perhaps use the term model in diff different ways but um, it is basically a representation of complex reality in a more simplified form and it's it's always related to a selection because that's the that's the idea of a model and now of course models can refer to so many different things of water management no they can model the the hydrology as such this is a hydrological model no it can be uh, limited to groundwater uh, groundwater model or hydrogeological model it can be related to uh, simulating a reservoir no um, and and then it can still uh, simulate perhaps the sediment transport in a in a river system including the reservoir or it can model the operation of a reservoir uh, understanding the inflow and and having operational routes for the outflow and then modeling the water level or whatever you like to or modeling the energy production from the reservoir but it can also be governance models saying how do we allocate water and what would be the economic benefits of of choosing this or that allocation many different models and it usually starts with a conceptual model that is the 
general interaction that we understand between the elements and and that is really let's say um yeah repeating the processes in the right in the real world but later it can of course be transferred also to quantitative models not saying that this is always possible or necessary sometimes a conceptual model is completely sufficient to understand what would a certain interaction mean but sometimes it's necessary to quantify it sometimes it's also not uh, possible to quantify because we don't have a, enough data on it no? but of course if you go more to the scientific application of, of it um, many times quantification would be necessary in order to test certain assumptions in a quantitative way yeah okay then there are physical models that are modeling certain ways but um, I, I, I skipped through this a little bit because we are really um, running out of time and and later in the exercise you will go you will work on these three systems that are mentioned on the watershed system then the agricultural system and the urban system as the the most typical subsystems of it let's briefly look now at the description of the system in its uh, let's say in the sense of the different flow components so i assume that you have all had an introduction to the to hydrology this is why this uh, this can be considered as a repetition just in order to inform the system thinking in a way that we are talking about the quantitative uh, relationship uh, between fluxes from one element to the other so uh, that is about key terms i think i will leave the slides for you so that you can go through it uh, having the idea that you have heard about the the water cycle already so just to show you what these slides are talking about of course a definition of climate would be essential you no know, if you are not understanding what is climate if you're not understanding what is the the elements of climate you cannot understand the hydrological cycle you no know, because that is determining the <clears throat> the typical relationship of the atmosphere with the land surface in your study region and and so here here's a definition of climate and of course uh, we refer here to the recent ipcc report which is a huge work um, but it's of course giving you not only ideas about climate change but also about the climate system and its element in general no? Uh, we also have a definition of weather. We should understand the difference between climate and weather. Climate is the average condition of uh, the, the, the typical climate parameters in a given space, whereas weather is the state of the atmosphere as a, as a, as a given time. You know? And that is, weather can change, and it's, uh, the, it's, it's, but, but the climate is constant assuming that okay we don't have climate change of course but in general terms it's constant over longer time periods at least you know climate was never constant in in earth history it always changed but nowadays we have of course a human made change uh, that we witness and uh, but still over uh, the the period of a couple of decades it is rather stable and that average is called climate and the 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 current uh, state of of the system is called weather yeah so that is here again yeah the idea of the difference between weather and climate in terms of temporal scales and also the idea of uh, the climate change climate change is of course a significant uh, change of the average conditions of uh, climate parameters in a given region no? and what is significant that is a question of statistics we are not going into that it's not an easy question so how to determine a trend is a very difficult uh, decision no? but it's uh, quite obvious that we are nowadays are facing a trend at least in terms of temperature this is very clear in some regions also statistically 
speaking, it's clear that there's a change of precipitation patterns, either more or less, or shifts of um, of typical rainy seasons, etc. But it's much more difficult to prove because the background variability is so high. And this is also shown here. You can have a look at that. I think you've seen these kind of figures. And you will have a separate lecture altogether on climate change and water. So it's not meant to be as an important part of this lecture, just to remind us of these basic connections between climate and weather as the determinants of the whole water cycle. Because at the end, water enters our system from the atmosphere. And this is what we know. And also is leaving the system to the atmosphere, determined by evapotranspiration. And evapotranspiration, on the other hand, is also very much determined by temperature. So that is why climate is so important. As I said, look at this report. You have, uh, the, this was published last year. The, the most recent one, uh, this is the Climate Change 2021, the physical science basis, um, but also especially the working group uh, two on um, climate change and its impacts uh, is very important. Now, hydrology, again, a very basic definition. So you can look at this. I think, again, I don't want to bore you with things you have heard altogether. I've seen that many of you have degrees in hydrology or either hydrogeology, but of course it's important to define it. And I'm also at the end of this lecture, I have this catalog of terms uh, that is, um, co-developed by WMO and UNESCO, I think that is a good reference if you, if you want to understand basic terms of hydrology, of climate, etc. There are some branches that are more recent, uh, like eco-hydrology. So eco-hydrology is a science that is much more looking at the role of ecosystems in the hydrological cycle. So far, we said, okay, there is rainfall, there's a land use, there's an impact on the runoff or the, the other components like infiltration, percolation, uh, etc. But we realize nowadays that the, the actual way we are using the land surface, that means the ecosystems that are um, uh, habitating them the, or habitating the land surface are very important. And also the soil and this, uh, the ecosystem is basically a conjuncture of soil, biota, atmosphere, or climate, um, and, and its complex interactions. So understanding ecosystems is very important for hydrology. And all the recent discussion that you have heard about nature-based solutions um, are basically considering exactly that point. Now, how can we understand the function of ecosystems in the hydrological cycle. May they be agricultural ecosystem, that means then agroecological systems, or forest systems, or other land uses, or may they be uh, green spaces in the city. These are also green ecosystems, or these are ecosystems with a certain combination of plants and soil, and, and how do they actually interact with the atmosphere, meaning with the precipitation receiving them or with the runoff they receive. If, if it is, for example, swales at the side of a road, how can they absorb uh, the, the overflow and, and uh, convert it to storage or convert it to perhaps a slower runoff altogether, having an attenuation of the peaks? We consider this nowadays as a very important part of how to steer a water resource system. That means we have to integrate the ecosystems in all forms in our thinking of steering water systems and managing the problems. All the three major problems, the too much water, too little water, or too dirty water can be solved also by ecosystems. And at the end, we will probably have a combination or hybrid solutions. No? But eco-hydrology is a younger branch of hydrology. and Actually, so is also socio hydrology, um, which is, for me, it's an obvious thing that, of course, now hydrologists who studied, uh, let's say, hydrological system in the past, they realized, oh, if we don't factor in the humans, we are missing uh, an important part because humans are significantly impacting the hydrological cycle and humans are the number one 
customer of, of the hydrological cycle, at least in our standing of water management. So for water managers, this is an obvious thing, but the hydrologist uh, also discussed that more recently. So uh, perhaps starting in, in around from the, the year 2000, you see more and more publications on social hydrology and I put here also a recent one. Yeah, and then very briefly, of course, the hydrological components precipitation this is a global map of precipitation different forms of precipitation each language has uh, different forms that it is sometimes not you find don't find it in english um, what you have in in a local language uh, just to, to or you can imagine that uh, snow for you in your part of the world may be one word but in northern countries uh, there are more than 20 words for snow, different types of snow, because they are living in a snow environment. You know? and, and the same perhaps also with, with different other forms of precipitation. You know? But obviously there are many different forms. There are also different origins of precipitation. In general, we differentiate the convective type of precipitation. That is the, the, just the fact that uh, heat entering the, the earth is leading to evapotranspiration, the humid air is going up, going to cooler regions, then it's pre condensing and going down again. Or it may be enforced by uh, air masses with a certain humidity climbing up or forced to climb up in a, in a mountain uh, range, and then cooling, and then you have the orographic rainfall that is leading to the fact that high mountains usually receive more precipitation. And then you have the cyclonic systems. I think, unfortunately, in in in, uh, uh, in the last month, a uh, huge cyclone hit also your part of the world. I'm not sure if it went all the way to Namibia. I don't think so. But in countries like Malawi, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, it was quite devastating. Um, yeah, you may have you you may find. Um, different words but the cyclone is the the, the typical um the typical term no hurricanes are the the same uh, it's but it's more used in the atlantic systems um, but it's the same the same phenomenon yeah you measure precipitation either in situ or with radar or with satellites nowadays um, you can also again relate to the climate system what you see here is the change of the precipitation pattern on earth over a year and you see very nicely the inner tropical conversion zone going from north to south so this is due to the to the axis of the earth leading to also the seasons that we are quite familiar with and you can see how precipitation changes over a year here on the right you see the month and uh, you can almost predict also how for whatever part in the world you are, when when do you more or less have the rainy season? Uh, where you are here, of course, is a permanently dry region. But if you have rainfalls, then probably uh, in in your um, in your your summertime. Why is it your summertime? It's in December, uh, January. February or something like that. That is when the ITC set is coming down. No? But it's it's very clear for perhaps some of you are from Southern Africa or from other countries here. So then you see uh, that is a clear seasonality. The same for us as well. And of course, yeah, extreme precipitation can be as much as uh, the highest ever measured one at least it must it's probably not the highest precipitation ever there in one day almost two meters of rainfall that is that's much more for example than we have here in cologne uh, over the whole year but the greatest one year rainfall is even more amazing that is um, more than 26 meters no in a place in india this is again a, a region where the monsoon as a phenomenon is converging with the orographic rainfall that means uh, going up the mountain cooling and then you have almost let's say you have a tremendous amount of, of of rainfall like 26 meters of rain 
in a year that is for me it's unbelievable no? but uh, you see how extreme it can be of course the lowest is zero then yeah let's perhaps summarize the hydrological cycle in this way we we can have here are two slides one is called water pools the other is called water fluxes in the pools we say how much water is at a given moment is stored in which or is yeah is is available in which part of the hydrological cycle and then you can quantify it here so it is uh, here measured in billions of cubic meters um, of water and you see here the numbers no 3 11 0 0.9 1.9 ocean 1000 uh, 1 130000 so this these are the numbers and you can compare how much how much you would have expected water is available for example groundwater is a lot is huge you no know, compared to water and rivers you no know? that is the total volume that you find find at any given moment uh, in the different compartments of the hydrological cycle and here you see the fluxes so the each arrow is uh, also related to a number and this is the flux the typical flux that you will observe uh, in, a, in a year no so that means how much here, here you see also the the unit no it's in um, 10 to the power of three cubic kilometers per year no so this this is the unit also for the other figure and uh, of course in the other it's not per year no it's uh, just the total volume and you can yeah have a look at it and and see if this is what you would have expected um understanding the flow of water in a, in the, its most general term other terms that are important as i mentioned already are then the the system boundaries so we are typically uh looking at natural system perhaps also more the the human impacted systems here and and its component the the boundaries the inflow the outflow and the storage so these are the major parts of of water fluxes in our, our systems uh, we also may look at some key terms again i have here put a link to the international glossary, glossary of hydrology to understand more Originally, I thought to have a short exercise here, but as I mentioned, these are typical terms that you should know what they mean. You know, some of them are more difficult, like wetlands. A clear definition of wetlands is quite difficult, uh, but um, it is, um, yeah, there are some common understandings. You know, and delta, if you are, um, Let's say if you think about the Okavango Delta, this is a delta in inland delta, um, quite interesting. Also in the Niger, you have a similar almost delta type of structure, but then it, uh, it uh, let's say it the, the Niger River is continuing, but much which much smaller fall after flow after the delta. Also groundwater, so we can differentiate to different types of groundwater. The term aquifer is uh, key. Um, also confined or unconfined aquifer you should know what that means an artesian aquifer what is an alluvial aquifer what is a caustic aquifer so these are just very basic terms make sure that you are aware of it if you are graduating with iwrm you should have all this this these basic definitions in mind no um, also the importance of soil water i always emphasize that um, soil is actually uh, the perhaps the most important storage that we have in our hydrologic hydrological system of course you have storage of water in lakes and rivers but you see the total volume is quite little if you go back to the pools uh, figure of course groundwater is very important as well storing water and groundwater is very important but the soil is often neglected as a element that we can also manage you know? so the way we are managing the soil is determining its capacity to store water and of course that starts with the infiltration that is the interface from rain falling on a surface to the soil um, if if that is not managed well then you have a direct runoff um, and and uh, you you will not have a recharge of the soil moisture 
Uh, then, of course, the pores in the soil are determining how much water can be stored in a soil. And uh, then also here, it's just an introduction. So you have a term like the saturated soil, that is when all the pores are filled with water. And then you have uh, a term like percolation, that means water is moving from the soil downward, you know, leaving the, the soil matrix, that is percolation. And then you are reaching the saturated zone so you can have saturated soil that is the soil is saturated but the actual saturated zone that is what we refer to as the the permanently saturated zone no that is the groundwater which is way below the soil so these are sometimes terms that that could lead to some confusion yeah and waiting point etc you you probably know if you're working in anything related to water then we have the human intervention of water. Of course, the biggest user globally is irrigation. We have also then the second biggest being industry. So in Germany, for example, the number one user much bigger than irrigation is energy production. It's our first water use uh, for cooling. But then also mining is a big water user, food processing, paper and pulp, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, domestic uses are, of course, perhaps most essential for us humans, but it's not a big, a huge user so far since urban areas are growing, population is growing, it's becoming more important, but altogether it's just 12% of all water use, um, but of course still very important. Uh, we should also th think of nature itself as a water user, demanding water if nature doesn't is not getting enough share of the water cycle, it is having huge damages. Um, navigation, that means the, the water re remaining in a river at a given time is an important water user. Recreation, tourism, of course, and you could add more, more types of water uses to that. There's also reference perhaps, how do we classify different water uses? This is called the, the system of uh, environmental economic accounting that is a standard uh, applied uh, globally. And there's the SEEA minus W, W stands for water, but it's using the same classification that also the economic accounting is using. You know, if, you, if you talk about, for example, economics, you have certain uh, economic sectors and we are using the same sectors here also for its their water consumption so that is a good system you should you should know about it if it comes to water accounting um, and perhaps also other terms are consumptive use non-consumptive use you should be familiar with that in terms of other interventions we talk about pollution you know you know at the end too little water too much water too dirty water so to dirty water is, of course, can also come from nature itself, but mostly humans are the cause of it. And here we differentiate two major parts, the point source pollution, the non-point source pollution. So that is also some term you should have come across. Um, we are very much uh, interested in understanding the temporal dynamics of water systems. So that means uh, how is a flux changing over time? That means, of course, there's temporal dynamics of rainfall, there could be seasonality, there could be interannual changes, or there could be just a embedded variability. Um, but also, uh, of course, we are very much interested in to look at extremes. No, um, This is what is usually causing the biggest problem, no? the drought as an extreme or the flood as an extreme. And last but not least, yeah, we want to look now at different model systems or typical systems, as I said. And for that, you can uh, enter the exercise together with Mirna, Bilal, and um, Samar. And here are the links for the terms. And I think with that, I'm finishing now. But way over time, sorry for that. Also for the uh, for stopping in between, but now I really will uh, yeah, ask you if you have questions. Other than that, I say, okay, I will stop the recording here.
So 